So good evening. Can everyone hear? I'm Robert Polito of the New School Graduate Writing Program, and it's my immense pleasure to welcome you to this special evening with Kaveh Khanum, featuring three remarkable poets. Cheryl Boyce Taylor, Courtney Lamar Charleston, and Ty Freedom Ford. And at the outset, I want to thank Lori Lynn Turner and Ben Fama for their work towards this evening. The New School Graduate Writing Program and Kaveh Khanum originate in the same year, 1996. And over the past 21 years, we've enjoyed a close collaboration on craft talks, legacy conversations, and public readings. And they're always among the very best poetry events we do every year. And I'm honored personally also to be on the Kaveh Khanum Board of Directors. Tonight's introducer and moderator is Elizabeth Bryant, the resourceful and dynamic programs and communications coordinator at Kaveh Khanum. So please join me now in welcoming Elizabeth. Hello and welcome. Can you hear me? I am wore heels today. So my name is Elizabeth Bryant. I am the Programs and Communications Coordinator at Kaveh Kanem Foundation. As you should know, Kaveh Kanem is a home for the many voices of black poetry. We are a national organization dedicated to cultivating the artistic and professional growth of black poets. You can learn more about us, what we're up to, and ways to support by visiting our website, kavekanampoets.org. November is packed with some wonderful events. We're kicking off with tonight's um, beautiful uh, lineup of poets. Uh, be sure to pick up our flyer at the back, detailing our full schedule for the rest of the season. On Friday, we will be at the NYU Lil Lillian Vernon House for a Kaveh Kanem Northwestern University Press Poetry Prize winners reading. The event will consist of presentations by Jacqueline Jones Lamont, Reginald L. Flood, and prize winner Natalie J. Graham. Also, submissions are now open for folks to apply to the 2018 Cave Canem Retreat. The application period closes on December 22nd at 11.59 p.m. Coming up, I know that's relevant information to some of you. <laughs> Coming up on November 28th, Kaveh Khanum will be launching our end of year giving campaign with Giving Tuesday. For 24 hours only on November 28th, Brooklyn Community Foundation will be matching gifts to Kaveh Khanum dollar for dollar up to $5,000. To know what's up, check out our Brooklyn Gives profile on brooklyngives.org. Follow us on Facebook and at Kaveh Khanum Poets on Instagram and Twitter. We so appreciate your support and encourage you all to join us on November 28th and onward as we invest literally in the future of American letters by investing in black poets. I'd like to thank the New School, MF, the New School's MFA Creative Writing Program with express gratitude to Lori Lynn Turner, Luis Jaramillo, and Robert Polito. Thanks also to our funders, the Lannan Foundation, the Whiting Foundation, Amazon Literary Partnerships, National Endowment for the Arts, the Department on Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts. Thank you also to Greenlight Books. Tonight their representatives, Hannah and Heather, will be selling books by our presenters. On that table, you will also be able to sign up for our mailing list. Of course, special thanks to our beautiful audience members. Now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's poets. Cheryl Boyce Taylor inherited a love of poetry from her mother, and as a young reader yearned for poems that had mangoes, coconut trees, and star apples, poems with brown girls with shiny cocoa skin and thick nappy braids contained by huge red and yellow bows. Born on the Caribbean island of Trinidad in the town of Arima, Cheryl is a poet, workshop facilitator and the founder and curator of Calypso Muse and the Glitter Pomegranate Performance Series. She is the author of four collections of poetry, Raw Air, Night When Moon Follows, Convincing the Body and Arrival, which is available for purchase this evening. And her work has been published in Callaloo, Pluck, and Prairie Schooner, among others. 
having earned an MFA in poetry from Stone Coast at the University of Southern Maine and an MSU from Fordham University. Cheryl has facilitated poetry workshops for Cave Canem, Poets and Writers, Poets House, and the Caribbean Literary and Cultural Center, and is a poetry judge for the New York Foundation for the Arts. Courtney Lamar Charleston is certain that hip hop is the reason why he fell in love with words in the first place. While we're on the subject of hip hop, I would like to take a moment to remind you using Courtney's own words that hip hop quote, has a more expansive vocabulary than any other genre of music and it defies the conventions of language to make new modes of expression regularly. Courtney is the author of Telepathologies, selected by D.A. Powell for the 2016 Saturnalia Books Poetry Prize, and also available for purchase this evening. He was awarded a 2017 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship for the, from the Poetry Foundation recently. Congratulations. And he has also received fellowships from Cave Canem, the Con Conversation Literary Festival, and the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. His poems have appeared in Poetry, New England Review, Gulf Coast, Tri-Quarterly, River Styx, and elsewhere. Ty Freedom Ford published her first poetry collection, How to Get Over, earlier this year, also available for sale tonight. For Ty, the idea of getting over is not a new concept in the black community. She goes on to say, we were forever looking for a come up or a hookup that wasn't a setup. So getting over is about surviving, living, and thriving in the face of so-called white supremacy. Ty is a New York City high school teach English teacher and Cave Canem fellow. Her poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in Drunken Boat, No Deer, the African American Literary Review, Vinyl, Muzzle, Rhino, Poetry, and others. Her work has also been featured in several anthologies, including the Breakbeat Poets' New American Poetry in the Age of Hip Hop. In 2012 and 2013, she completed two multi-city tours as a part of a queer women of color literary salon named The Revival. Ty lives and loves in Brooklyn, where she is the co-editor at No Dear Magazine. Now, please join me in welcoming Cheryl Boyce Taylor. Hi, everyone. Hey, how are you? Hey. <laughs> so, um, thank you for being here. I'm very excited to be reading this evening. And actually, today, November 1st, marks 53 years that I've been living in New York City. <laughs> and you know, for the last few years, I've been saying, I'm sick of this space, I'm getting out. But you know, when something happens like yesterday, you say, oh, my New York. I mean, it really hits you in your heart since I grew up um, in Queens. So I'm going to start off with two poems, and one poem would be the first day I arrived at school in New York City from Trinidad. I was 13 years old. And this piece is called I Name Gal. November 1st, 1964, Day of the Dead. Gal take flight from planet hummingbird, Ibeji daughter, born of Ibeji mother, gal reach America. Tanti Ina meet gal at Kennedy Airport in the maroon Chevy Nova. She bring a long brown coat with fur lining. She bring gloves, boots, and fur hat. Gal ain't like them things at all. Lord, they too big and fluffy. Gal prefer she bright island colors and she trini dialect. Next day, gal step in the school big and important, wearing she island colors proud, proud. I name gal, she beams. The children laugh loud at her accent. The sea at Marabella. And Marabella is on the southern coast of Trinidad called San Fernando. 
And my brother and I spent a lot of time there with my mother's sister during summer vacations. And I still miss it all these years later. The sea at Marabella. I want the pound of ocean by the sea at Marabella. I want my woolly fat braids tied to flying ribbons, flapping like birds' wings. I want my stick thin legs, running after Cousin Vilma's bike, begging for a ride, mouth filled with salt air and nutty sand. I want the loose butts of old women falling out of their two small swimsuits, their eyes halfway hidden under the rims of big Panama hats their French Creole spicing up the dead jellyfish thick air. I want to churn the wooden ice cream freezer while the boys pack it with salt and ice. I want my Trinidad, her chest a finely sculpted bamboo bowl, her shoulders the bright jawbone of God. I want to feel the sting of hot sand, the pound of ocean, the pound of ocean from my Marabella Sea. So I came to New York by myself and left my mother and family in Trinidad. I came to live with my mother's sister. And so it was a year and more before my mother arrived and so this is the day that my mother arrived. It's called Independence Day in a, on a lot of levels, but it was actually the day after July 4th. Mom arrived in New York City a day before July 4th, one year since I last saw her. In her travel bag, a small red Bible, a handful of Karali Bush for sugar diabetes, and painful cramps, a susu book and a red solo. Later in bed, I hugged mommy tight, tight. We talked all night. Then she said, child, I miss the raw of your big mouth most. Girl, let me tell you, I didn't tell plenty people I was going away, you know. I didn't want nobody to put goat mouth on me, and then I never reach America. We fell apart with crazy laughter. Zuhitsuan eating poems, and this, this poem is dedicated to my mother because uh, she didn't write her own poems, but they had to memorize long English poems and so she would memorize them and recite them all around the house. This is the um, household that myself and my son Malik inhabited. So you know um, why Malik became the type of performer that he did. Zuhitsu on eating poems for my mother and for my son Malik. At 14, I learned the ways of poetry, how it enters your heart then hands full frame. It works its way down the torso, then out of the mouth. That glorious undeveloped mouth that only knows chapstick and girlish giggles. A mouth unknown to beauty, still innocent to the delicious pineapple of a woman's kiss. At 20, I fell out with my new husband of less than a year. My four-month-old son and I climbed into my mother's bed. She held us and read poems. Mom reads Gwendolyn Brooks, Georgia Douglas Johnson. She reads Derek Walcott, Leopold Senghor, and Langston Hughes. Something shifts at the magic of their songs. The husband calls and calls, we do not answer. What holds me is this mystic doorway of words and the rich hum of my mother's voice in the living room of these poems. A crop of words loop my heart, 
There are azaleas and hibiscus where the hurt used to be. Hibiscus rosa lowers blood pressure, lowers cholesterol, lowers blood sugar, prevents heart disease. Its root soothes mu mucous membranes. Hibiscus flowers are also known as Jamaican sorrel. As a child in Trinidad, I drank sorrel. In Jamaica, I drank sorrel and ate poems. I decorate my windows with pink azaleas and red hibiscus. Place hibiscus at the front door for abundance. I eat poems for breakfast. Sprinkle some on my honeydew melon on my Inca red quinoa. I feed poems to my son. He eats them like heirloom tomatoes. Later, when he is gone, I make murals of poems, each painted with the Bulgarian rose of tree bark. While the kettle hums, I lure another string of words, lith like dragonflies the wail of tribes ascending in the language of trees. Thank you. OK. So this poem is called Husband, and it's for uh, my wife. She's not here tonight. Wait till I tell her that you were both here. <laughs> what lovely star caused your hands to fall across my waist? Your fingers, fingers whistled through the streets of my December hair. Your talk lowered me to the dance floor, each line punctuated with longing until hallelujah, hallelujah, I led her to my queen bed at the brightest corner of the room. Days later, I call her husband. <laughs> Things I do in the dark after June Jordan. I love June Jordan and I had a chance to study with her. She was fierce and serious much like Audre Lorde was fierce and serious. But what a wonderful poet. I, we could not do without her work on this planet. If you haven't read her, you're missing out. So get her work. Things I do in the dark. This crying, praying, sweet fondling, reaching for milk-drained breast, all I find are dry stalks, this crude wire, this crooked strut, this wooden fish, this dried smoke, this marigold wreath, this pink rose quartz, this holy water. These are things I do. These are things I do, I do in the dark. This clawing of self, this crying, hurting, praying, paying ghosts, this crude gauze mouth, this kneading of flesh to make whole again. These are things I do in the dark. This piecing together, this mauve body, this flat rubber heart. And where did I go? Where did I go? Where did I go? Reaching for that fly yellow girl, where did I go? This spirit talk, spirit talk, talking, talking, hurricane root of middle passage. This talk, talking, taking the hurricane root of middle passage. Talking in the dark, praying, tying the head in white cotton, circling the hips with red beads, calling, calling the dead, calling Shango, oh yeah, mama, mama, where did I go? This midwife, me, this bird walk, this meteor, this shell reader, 
sweet bush beater, this white candle, this cowrie shell, tarot cards, this peacock feather, this cigar, white veil, praying in the dirt, praying in the dirt, flirting with the dance, talking in the dark, praying, 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 flirting with the dance. Thank you. Two more poems. Um, I'm a type one diabetic for almost 50 years. And um, it was the disease that um, took my son's life. And um, it's, it's some serious, serious, it's a serious disease. So this piece is called Sugar. My pancreas was fretful and never did work well. The day it finally gave out, it ambushed my entire planet. From hibiscus to orange blossom, from insulin shock to hospital bed, the thud of ripe mangoes falling in thick mud. From nutmeg blurred eyes to dusty charred shell, from penicillin to lantis, the ripe photographs of my life escape through old boarded up windows. My sugar house cracked and folded in on itself, part of my threshold gone forever. Dear missing pancreas, dear missing pancreas, I love you, you strange and unforgettable bastard. And the last piece is called Hush the Call of Names, and it's uh, for 9-11. And I actually saw the towers going down. I worked in Manhattan, and we could see them from the 15th floor of the building I worked in. And um, I have watched year after year calling the calling the names, and I've seen little children who didn't even know those people call the names and cry and shake, and my background, I'm a social worker, so I have a lot to say about that legacy. I wish it would be more private. Anyway, this is my poem called Hush the Call of Names. This is the year we hush the call of names. Our dead are stars. They have outlasted this tincture of dried wreaths. Let the dead release their porcelain confessions, their words a saffron tapestry woven with the joys of its own geography. Give them back their magic. In this coming season of colored leaves, our lives hum with true abundance. Listen, listen, hush the call of names. Give the dead back their beauty. Let their eyes return like agates. Let their noise in this room be poems. Be poems, be topaz, be blue iris, a cup of hibiscus tea. And from this moment, lift your head for signs of life. And from this moment, let us sing, let us sing, let us begin again. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Good. Awesome. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I'm excited to be here, excited to share some words with you all, excited to read with Cheryl and Ty. Um, what I planned on doing was reading uh, a few poems uh, from telepathologies, uh, and then I thought I'd offer maybe one 
uh, poem or two poems that are more recent than the book, but um, the series is called New Work, so I just felt inspired by that, I guess. We'll start with the first poem in Telepathologies. How do you raise a black child from the dead with pallbearers who are half as young as their faces suggest and twice the oxen they should be without a daddy at all or with a daddy in prison or at home or in a different home with a mama with a grandmama, if mama ain't around, maybe even if she is, in a house or not, in the hood, in the suburbs, if you're smart or not afraid of white fear, or even if you are, taking risks, scratching lottery tickets, making big bets on a basketball court, inside a courtroom, poorly in the ever pathological court of opinion, on faith, like a prayer from the belly of a whale, in church on Sunday morning, on Monday, Tuesday, and every other, before school and after, in a school you hope doesn't fail, in a school of thought named for Frederick Douglass, old school or not at all, with hip hop or without, at least with the little Curtis Mayfield, some Motown, <laughs> sounds by Sam Cooke, eating that good down home cooking, putting some wood to their behind, with a switch, with a belt to keep their pants high, not high all the time, on all time highs, at all times until they learn not to feel and think so lowly of their aims, to be six feet tall and not under, with a little elbow grease and some duct tape, sweating bullets on a short leash, away from the big boys on the block, away from the boys in blue, without the frill of innocence from the dead, Again, like a flag. <clears throat> so this next poem uh, was inspired by some students I had um, while I was uh, in college uh, in Philadelphia. I would do poetry workshops uh, in, the, in the jails um, in Philly. My students were all young men and women under the age of 17 who were being held in adult prisons in Philly. So this poem is kind of speaking to that experience a little bit. Meditation on wings and meeting Gabriel in a Philadelphia prison. And it also is marked with an epigraph from the MC Dice Raw. A lot of niggas go to prison. How many come out Malcolm X? Gabriel, well, first and foremost, he was a black boy, like me, like a disproportion of the boys in the room with us, some brutal ratio. You know, I still remember that first poetry workshop he joined the class. We were shooting with the brothers on the Rubik's Cube of love passing it like a blunt in circle over a rotation of songs, even hands that twisted necks having trouble subduing it, the halo that sharing ourselves is. Dean asked from his corner of the city if I love my girlfriend, because the girls he's seen around there aren't the kind you give the same crown as your mother. Them Johns be, as he says. From another corner, mention of a newborn daughter, how she fits in his hand like a stolen watch, 
though we don't speak long about time borrowed or taken. Then there's another shout, an allusion to the heat of the color pink, red nodding, Aaron laughing, Gabriel writing, pushed against his edges like a point of graphite, heaven's light making a keyhole of him, the gold cross around his neck reflecting the rays into my heathen, its bottomless color. When I freed my eyes, I looked upon him from a position of privilege, right place, right time. I noticed his skin was both darker and smoother than my own, and our eyes were mud by birth, so neither could decide which of us was guilty and which was innocent, who was saint and who was sinner. I spoke to him in the way God speaks to emptiness, but he didn't speak back. The visible clump of a fist nestled between his vocal cords. Maybe the very reason why he was even here, not more than 16 years old and behind bars like a rapper's persona. Hopefully the kind who name drops Malcolm X. All the verses we mull, maybe his own Elijah, his new wings of gauze. Now, this next one I actually haven't read out loud before, um, or to an audience, I should say. Um, it's broken up into sections, but they're not numbered or anything, so when I raise my hand, I'll just use that to denote the start of the next section. The Hood. In the moonlight, a steeple of cloth crowns the head of a good church-going man. Pay little mind to his serpent's tongue, his jagged teeth deteriorated from chewing coal, his scornful eyes as bloodshot as the momentum of a bullet through soft tissue. Take his word that the rope was tied of good intentions, tied of great love for country, for family, for manhood. In imitation of Christ, he carried that cross here on his back, the fire set to it is not hatred. Moses will testify it is the healthy fear of God. Our brother in a gentler nature is only reminding us of our proper place. And in Sunday affection, we call him our hood. Come dawn, all the colored kids wipe ash from eye, pack their school bags, walk past the statuesque making monument of the corner in front of the liquor store, past the pigeon man passed out on the sidewalk. Trace the dance of a Christian prayer across the busiest streets. In their classrooms they read the same books that taught their grandparents. Both things kinds of expository, unhinged at the spines from life without retirement just like the old janitor sanded down to bone, his hands callous. If one could count the splinters that have retired in them from pushing mops and brooms day after day, they'd have ample to recreate the accessory of the Messiah's end, what set mold for gold chains of rapper fame. While we sleep, he knocks against the window, shouting epithets, making threats, fires a few gunshots into the air for effect. We don't go outside, don't confront him brandishing a pistol of our own, don't call police, because the police are already here keeping order. We simply wait for law to pass. Around here, black men disappear without notice, never return from the liquor store, liquor store a mile down the road. The rumors will spread, say he went for cigarettes, but in the end became smoke drowned in wind. 
funeral held in the church a few blocks away from Big Mama's house, its steeple a historical illusion in the distance. Everyone passed his casket dressed in dark, unmistakable ethnicity, even the men crying as fluently as faucet handles turn, the rope burns on his throat well hidden by a necktie. When night fell again, more shots, a couple windows broken by the butts of shotguns, fires ignited on crosses. We slept through it all, our bones of rock, the word in his mouth red hot, hateful, yet warm enough to live with. The fire, a tent, is pitched around in brotherhood wherever we go. That also reminds us why our blood is easy shed. I'm not a racist. I'm a realist. If I see a pack of hoods approaching, loitering, acting a littering of public sidewalks, I simply move to the other side of the street, play it safe. I keep it on me at all times for safety purposes. In the event of open fire, you'd be a hazard, I told them when I, regrettably, couldn't allow the lot of them into the party. We're part of the same political party, according to all the numbers I've seen. When I shut the schools down, I was just doing what must be done to balance a city budget out of whack. When I put what I found in his trunk on balance, it was enough to tip the scale towards a felony. I used to be a waiter, and they never tipped very well in my experience. While we were placing bets, I noticed him tip his hand ever so slightly, and there was a race of, uh, face card in it. He didn't seem like much of a bluffer, so I stood my ground. On the grounds of merit, that's how I got into Yale. I'm just not that into black girls, personally. I mean, personally, I don't see color. I'm so sorry. I really didn't see you there. There they go, using that word again. If they can say it, then why can't I? I can't understand why everybody is so sensitive these days. I admit, what I said sounded a little bit insensitive, but believe me, I'm not a racist. I'm a realist. If I see a pack of hoods approaching, loitering, acting, a littering of public sidewalks, I simply move to the other side. I keep it on me at all times for, for purposes. In the event of a hazard, open fire, I told them, regrettably, looking at the body splayed before me. Okay. <clears throat> How do you forgive? Don't squeeze. Ease up on the trigger. Reopen your mouth. Remove the barrel. Mouth the deeper wound with the wound called a mouth. Don't wound whoever is near enough to hear you shatter into tears, sweat, blood, scrap metal. Unload the clip, bullet by bullet, until all of them are accounted for, definitively cold. Disassemble the assault rifle. Take shots of liquor to the chest in rapid fire. Set your heart on fire like a straw man. Have a small change of heart. 
find an arrhythmia in the pulse of wrath. Box the shadows and phantoms with the flashlight. Unclench your heart-sized fist. Extend your open hand, palm up, like an iron flat white flag. Politely wave off their apology with your dominant hand. Twist a dish rag like a chicken neck with your bare hands. Clean the house until you can't fathom anything except the color of water. Think clearly. Think within the marrow of God, bow and bend towards sources of soft light. Be carried lightly inside the womb of a love song. Love something better than you are. Realize it's better to be alone than not be at all. Be bigger than the many, many things that try to kill you dead. Hang pictures of the dead on the wall, though sometimes they harmed you in their practice of love. Wall off certain rooms in the house, but let the house stand. St save stomach for bread's breaking. Eat birds because you believe in becoming what you consume. How the saying goes, more easily through the mind than even fresh air. Believe in a heaven up there equally, if not more, than hell. Remember the hell you went through in order to survive. Survive, and don't tell them sorry. And then I'll just close with this last poem. Um, this one is not in the book, but I wanted to read it anyway. Um, marginalization. And it has an epigraph from Jorge Luis Borges. When writers die, they become books, which is, after all, not too bad an incarnation. <laughs> the message window tells me there are places on the page where nothing will be printed at all. And I sit with that, trying to process the word processor's words, what they mean, how much they should weigh on my mind. I've always understood what's written to be the physical remains of what's spoken or thought, proof that cognition, a life of intellect or intelligence, even happened. Typography, calligraphy acting almost as a kind of bone, and bones being what give any life its initial shape and double as the ruins it leaves behind if not burned. To be here and to be heard, these are the same human need at heart, I believe. I'd never considered before that silence could be a visual impairment until I experienced the deafness of an eyes looking through me. I said, I was standing right here, ma'am, but these words didn't get recorded or they fell outside the boundaries of whatever book we were supposed to be playing by. I know I'm made of ghosts, but I still find the situation utterly ridiculous. It revised the meaning of illiteracy for me such that I now hear race explicitly in the function of its body as it bangs against the tongue to make sound like rain against sorrow. Because slaves weren't allowed to read we remember them by the bones they left behind, the bones in the ground, the bones in our bones, like shadows. But that's not good enough anymore. For me, living in the era of black excellence, education, when I die, I don't wish to die completely. I want to find a page I can fit on, a way to say I had a voice in what happened to me, even if I couldn't stop it entirely, my words of pleading trailing off into the whiteness a machine told me at all costs must be maintained and will. Thank you. What's up? How y'all doing? Good. Where you going? <laughs> I will. 
Let's go. That's okay. Re up, re up. So good. Um, so cool. Um, it's really like super duper happy. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's really happy to be here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm psyched to read with Cheryl, who's like been a poetry mom to me um, since I've been in New York. Um, I've been blessed to sort of have her as a mentor and a, you know, just a guiding light and, and force in my life with regard to my writing and has always been like a really big cheerleader of mine. So I appreciate you. And it's such an honor to read with you. And Courtney, my young blood brother, coming through and just killing the game, son. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to be sort of wedged in the middle of these folks, you know, I guess age-wise and, sh and shit. I think they probably did that on purpose, I don't know, but it's a good, it's cool, it's cool. Um, at first I was feeling kind of away because my name didn't have a C in it. Like I was like trying to figure that out. Uh, but you got the three names. Yes, yes, that's right, it's true, there we go. So, um, I didn't know what I was going to read, and, and Cheryl, Cheryl's reading inspired me to read uh, some of these pieces, uh, uh, I guess, about my life and, and childhood, you talking about your family and stuff. So I'll start with a piece. In the book, there are a bunch of past life portraits. Um, some are personal, some are persona pieces. Um, this is a personal one. <clears throat> past life portrait as tomboy, age 10. I followed them, the boys who smelled like rusted shopping carts, river water, piss. I would kiss them, these boys who tasted like grape now and laters, tap water, sweat. I wanted them. Those boys with hands fast like pool hall hustlers, running water, threat. I wanted to be them, one of the boys who walked like young blood, cool water, daddy. I followed them, tomboy with body like coke bottle, bloody water, mama. Followed them pretty boys with bodies like empty houses, no running water, wet. So I'm gonna give you a rule right now before you even start to clap. My poems get jealous of each other if you clap more for one <laughs> than the other. You know, one, or one gets the big head and then I gotta go home and deal with this poem that like, so for the sake of that, let's just, just let's be continuous and hold out applause to the end. Um, so my name, Ty Freedom Ford, since we're talking about names, um, is not the name I was born with. <clears throat> it's not the name that appeared originally on my birth certificate. Um, and so this poem speaks to that <clears throat> namesake. Sometimes they fuck up. Fit you with a name two sizes too small and it scrapes your shins and chafes your spirit down to sawdust. And sometimes the name too old for you, already rust in the mouth of a newborn, torn from some grandmama's past, her fast legacy simmering in the ground. And sometimes the name don't sound right in your bones, gathers in the joints and aches before the rain come, vibrates your spine toward curve. And sometimes the name you don't deserve, too grand for all your regularness. It blots you invisible. And sometimes the name is perfect, but of course, they fuck it up, emphasize the wrong syllables, say it too slow or without enough energy to make it glow, and sometimes they fuck it out of you. Graffiti it with brutal memory, and one day you wake knowing it must change. So when I moved to New York in 2000, I changed it. <clears throat> or moved back to New York, rather. Um, and this was one of the reasons why. Past life, 
self-portrait, circa, circa 1979, Atlanta. Um, there's some plays on words in here, so I'll try to like cue you in to what I'm saying um, in those places. This basement, damp cement. Little girl and her curiosity come tumbling down steps into a familiar darkness. A family of hands fumbling, the soft sound of Bible pages, a prayer? A mumbling, a hardening, a dumb, clumsy thing, this voice, a cobwebbed water heater boiling secretion into spit. This place meant damn semen. Penis grows amid the bush, a wet whisper, come here, a zip, unzip. A fuzzy taste tickling, a dingling, dangling, a push, a strangling, a dank stank gathering, a mouth, a festival of dirt, a tongue, a festering, blur and blurt, stutter and spurt, what can bloom but lies? Displacement, damned, sea men. I do not belong here. This place, basement, cement, semen, semen, demon, dam, damned, sham, shame, shamed, damn shame. This place, dislodged, misplaced, dislocated, replaced, displaced. Is that my mouth, balled tight and honest as a fist? So, this poem is like my, my sort of, uh, I guess, family mythology piece. It's called Big Bang Theory. For my granny, Lily Mae Ford. In theory, she Big Bang. Her brown round lump of a body, star dusting half dozen babies into being and giving God all the glory. First, Junior, who sprang to 6'4 like his daddy, ate up everything, including the cardboard, pickled his tongue in sips of Thunderbird till shriveled, shriveled liver polka dotted his hands and lips pink. Sister came next wearing ethyl like storm cloud and hex, shamed her into Angelina, meaning messenger of God, but she big and unpretty as a heathen. Doris Yvonne got all the pretty and the skinny and the crazy so folks couldn't covet. At six, she saw colors fuzzed round people, thought everybody had this rainbow vision then in 1952, my mama Brown nosed herself here. Granny named her Amber, a quiet, too dark punk of a girl, ass whippings all the way home from school, married her fool self off at 14. Wayne came out in handcuffs, did not pass go, went straight to jail, met Muhammad and became Ramel, became crackhead, became ghost. Pamela named me, cute as she wanna be spoiled with religion, granny's baby. Spent half her life in the church testifying to chicken wings, getting her Holy Ghost on. Granny, big bang, sequined hat gangster, kicked Otis Sr. out for mucking up her doilies with engine grease. Grandbabies everywhere, fat as pork rinds and hungry as slaves, she banged pots till they bled gravy. Banged her body, banged her big body to the floor and stroke invented serious as a heart attack. She buried all the men with Jesus on her breath. And when her big bone self, big bang to dust, we didn't call it death. We called it magic. So my grandmother 
I was 4'11 and probably about 250 pounds. My grandfather was 6'4 and that was his big legs, but she also had diabetes, heart disease. Like, you know, she had had strokes like many, many times. And yet my grandfather died and she outlived him by like 12 years, which just was amazing to me. But it was a testament to the type of woman that she was, just strong, strong, right? Um, this piece is for my, for my, my mother and my auntie's sister. Um, which apparently, I, I guess older, older sibling, older women siblings, I guess in Southern households were often called sister. Um, so sister, from my mother and auntie sister. By the time you reach home, a pack of black mouths at your back, sister is leaning in the door frame, frowning. Your pigeon-toed saddle shoes dust themselves up the driveway, your defeated limbs disown you, wish for a braver body. At the porch steps, sister rolls her eyes, lips pursed. Your sweated out brow, your sweated out bangs, a ghetto visor for your browning brow. In 1962, the sun still hates niggers. Sister is lighter, older, heavier, and almost ugly. This makes her the meanest person you have ever shared a bed with, and she can't stand punks. She palms a broken broom handle, eyes a piece of chain link dangling on the twisted wrought iron railing, squints at a rock the size of a shot put, shakes her head at your helpless self, and you know that there ain't no coming home unless you turn round, grab the chain, swing blindly, and fight. The sun, the black mouths, a chorus of cuss words singing your praises. Of course, your eyeless swinging misses, but your feasts are sudden beasts feasting on heat and open mouths. So my, uh, my father and I are estranged. Um, and he married and, and had two sons, which my sister and I just assumed replaced she and I. And uh, you know, it had been a while and come to find out my 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 oldest stepbrother had been looking for us. Um and so um we 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 were reunited and they invited us down for his high school graduation. Um and the last time I had saw him he was five years old. Um, so this is game recognizes game. In honor of my half-brother Calvin's graduation from high school, I fool myself down to Virginia, half curious, full of anger, and burdened by silence. Solely on the strength of my genetic inheritance, I am there to show you this mirror. Your nose, eyebrows, turned down mouth, childish pout to show you how fine I have turned out in spite of your absence. When you and Calvin show up, me and Tiffany are in the garage, knocking balls around on the pool table. Red-eyed and haggard, you insult me right off talking about what I don't know or something like that. You say, I don't get no hug, and I say no offer you my hand. Folks have gathered, liquored and feeling festive, beer in hand, I summon my project hustle. Balls scatter, drop like snitches. All five brothers, tight with defeat, quietly root for you. I am undaunted, remembering me at 10, chopping down dudes twice my size, the cocky rise in my voice yelling, next! but you were gone by then. Your shots are quick and sure as they should be in your house, on your table. But when you miss on the eight, I bank it in the corner, offer you my hand, say, good game. So, I think three more. Um, Past life portrait, circa 1989 for Uncle Mel. 
Remember, Wayne came out in handcuffs, did not pass go, went directly to jail, met Muhammad and became Ra Mel. We knew him as Uncle Mel. That night you came knocking, boogeyman haunting the whites of your eyes. When you came inside, eyes flitting about the room like a cooped pigeon. When you unplugged the VCR, wrapped the cord with a tornado of hands, when you said, I'm sick, I'm sorry, we forgave you. When I opened the door, let you in, more concerned with some version of perfect, maybe it was the Cosby show or some other Thursday night rerun, my eyes refused to release, I turned my back and forgave you as I plopped on the couch next to Tiffany, watching as you whipped the wire into a frenzy, the VCR's black bulk against your chest, your eyes a blank page, yearning. Our mouths forgave you, even if the only word we knew was no. Our slow motion heads blurring the screen blue, we forgave you, your back, the door slamming us silent. We watched the rest of the show as if you had been a commercial, a familiar ghost, my mother's brother, Irish twin. She, 11 months your senior, singing that same old song, I'm sick. We forgave you. Ain't like we had no videotapes anyway, and at least you didn't take the TV. So this is a bop, uh, Miss Cleo Can't Save You. Um, and I always have to just talk about Miss Cleo because um, some younger audience may not, audiences may not get that reference, but do we all know who Miss Cleo is? Thank you, call me now, yes? <laughs> she was a fake Jamaican psychic on TV, for those who don't know. Um, you would call the member of the 1-900 numbers and shit, right? Um, so yeah, and she eventually got locked up, right? Yeah, and because it was like straight up fraud. I'm just like, it's for entertainment purposes only. We get that. We just want to be like entertained. Um, but apparently they locked their ass up and she wound up dying, I remember. But um, anyway, in one of the commercials, there's a girl who says, I think someone put roots on me. Um, and so because a bop uses song lyrics, the song lyrics are from a D'Angelo song called The Root. Okay. In 1985, crack raped my mama, gnawed her black bottom down to the bone, a skeleton in our closet, bathroom, back room, transistor drone and static we heard when ears stuck to the door, suctioning sound, deciphering suck from gluttonous moan. She done worked the route, done worked the route that will not be reversed. Where are your hips, mama? Whittled away like a pastime. Paradise lost its swag. Crack sucked your titties saggy. Tagged frown lines on your forehead like graffiti. Choked your voice into a reedy whisper. Sinister rasp of denial while we witnessed your magic making TVs disappear. She done worked the route, done worked the route that will not be reversed. Vanished your laughter into gasp, huff. They fired your ass from the wind Dixie when your till came up short, came home with a bag full of bruised fruit. Locked your door, pop locked and puffed till flame boogalooed blue. Rock, rock, planet rock. Don't stop. She done worked the route, done worked the route that will not be reversed. So the last poem, I have time. Um, the last poem is actually the newest poem in the book. My Auntie Yvonne, the one who could see auras around people, um, passed away last year this time actually. Um, and I was, in, um, I was in South Africa and I was unable to go to her funeral, but she was my favorite aunt because she was weird and, and, and kind and um, and she called me the golden child because she said I had a golden aura and apparently the golden aura is the only aura that can ward off negative energy. So all my life I've been like, you know, yes. 
how to get over for Auntie Yvonne. Trip the light ecstatic, X-ray prism vision, black folk cloaked in broken rainbows, but what we know, glow ultraviolet, grow your own weed and call it vegetables. Cultivate seeds sliding slick against a Rick James album cover, rock two Indian braids and a turban, wear a disturbing amount of purple. Lavish lavender upon us earthlings with weak frequencies following the wrong calendar. Suffer Sundays no more. Barefoot hallelujah to the Jefferson's theme song. Dream beyond the halo of Jesus, his miraculous glow, and what aura he rocking. Ain't I your golden child? Auntie, be a Prince song, cause there is joy in repetition. Run up the light bill with Lauren Hill's soulful well. This life, this young son, your burden to carry. Remarry? Unlikely. Niggas not worthy. Instead, bury your heart in a movie screen. Done seen every Rocky. Know every last dragon scene. Do a mean show nuff impression. Catching bullets with your teeth. Nigga, please. <laughs> Memorize the kiss between Timac and Vanity, their celluloid bliss. You gift me my ego. Gift me my gift before it had a bow or know its presence. Gift me my golden, myself at 10 years old, my beloved La Tigra Windbreaker, circa 1983. Remember me, up rocking gym floors before class. You gift me my badass, my tomboy, my ghetto joy. Gift me my bougie and chocolate covered strawberries and now, as I listen to Natalie Merchant's kind and generous as you did over and over and over, she loved that song. A sudden melancholy becomes me because I know your tired body was no longer a vessel of light, but of smoke and Cora's light. And I know how your onlyness, onlyest beat the fight out of you. How Celie's blues became your bruised scripture. How rage simmered so long it volcanoed into rupture. Now you elsewhere, all pulse and fluorescent glow. On the day of your funeral, Tiffany sermons forgiveness and I, 8,000 miles away, wonder the color of your dress. The rest is easy, auntie. Rest easy, auntie. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't sing, but thank you. <laughs> Just one more round of applause for the magic that was conjured. Cheryl Boyce Taylor, Courtney Lamar Charleston, and Ty Freedom Ford, thank you so much. Um, everyone, please buy books, sign up for our newsletter, and enjoy each other's company. Thank you.